This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio. doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, Geek Leader today, I'm honored to have Adrian Kelly on the show. He is a uh, qualified solicitor, lecturer, and a lifelong learner. He's the author of a book called The Success Complex, which we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, and in that book, he has some great examples about some of the um, core skills vital to overcoming challenges, including those from Napoleon, Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., and many more. Anyway, with all that being said, Adrian, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Great to be here. Yeah, so um, I'm excited to uh, learn more about what is the success complex. But before we get to that, if you don't mind, just tell the audience about, about your background and how you got to where you are and why you decided to put this book together. Absolutely. So I suppose to start a few years back, I was uh, quite a poor student at school for a variety of reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I decided um, to repeat my leave insert, which is like your final year exams, I suppose, uh, to you guys in the States. And, uh, you know, I did quite a bit better when I applied myself. Um, went on and became a lawyer, as you would call it, spent six years as a criminal lawyer. And then when the downturn hit here, you know, the financial crash, that changed a lot of things in the industry. And uh, I had an opportunity to move on and do something else. Um, I could have stayed on, but, you know, the, the money had been reduced. There was a lot more competition in the marketplace for a variety of reasons. So I decided to try something else. So I moved into Renewable Energy with a friend of mine. We formed a business and uh, developed, a, developed a company. And uh, I spent eight, nine years doing that quite successfully at the, the time. Um, I left that business. It, it continued on for about under four years, but unfortunately, the pandemic uh, ultimately killed it off because, uh, you know, supply chains and everything else. But yep. in 2018, I moved into uh, more business consultancy, working for the government, working for a big law firm, and uh, working with problems, problems that businesses encounter. And then and then transitioned into Brexit advice, where I work on people in Brexit. And I suppose how I moved into kind of uh, behavioral science, performance psychology was more, I suppose, around my sporting experiences. Um, I played a variety of sports and uh, coached a variety of sports. And with, with the business consultancy, uh, it, something seemed to come together with those two things in terms of trying to get the best out of ourselves, avoid pitfalls and, you know, get some insights that we can we can all use to do things better. And that's kind of where the nucleus I came from in terms of my career path. In terms of the book itself, the success complex, uh, the complex is, is intended to be, you know, like a fear of small spaces or heights, a complex. What's what's stopping you from from achieving your personal success or your success complex? And what I found, having read a, 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 around this area quite a bit, it's it's a jungle of information in terms of positive psychology and and, and improvement. And there there's some very valuable. Um, but less accessible behavioral science and performance psychology research and reports out there and studies that people probably are not that aware of. And I thought it would be an interesting exploration to delve into some of that, look at some, you know, well-known people and events throughout history and uh, develop a structure around that that allows a little bit of learning along the way as we explore those stories throughout the book. And also uh, beyond the book, I wanted to give the reader a structure where uh, they could evaluate new information after reading the book and see where it fits for them. So I split the book into three parts. One is skills you might acquire to overcome challenge, which I'll talk about. The second part is balance. Everything's about balance in terms of uh, sustaining uh, improvements and performance gains. And then the final part of the book, which is probably the deepest and maybe most interesting, is direction. Uh, so I'm mean, and trying to come up with, you know, I try to come up with three things that... Uh, are worth having more of our more of in our lives. You know, everybody always thinks of money when they think of success or fame or whatever it might be. So I was trying to think of things that were, were, were really worth having more of in our lives. And eventually I settled on three things which were uh, control, purpose, and transcendence. Not in the religious sense, but more in the fulfillment through um through what we can what we can do for others. And there's a lot of behavioral science around that as well, including Maslow. 
Um, so that that's kind of the, the the fifth notes highlights. And uh, and the other great thing, John, about writing the book is it gives you kind of a free pass to interview people. And I, I love talking to people. Yeah, I'm sure you do too. I love talking to people, hearing their insights, their views of the world. And uh, I, I'm, I managed to, to track down and talk to some really interesting professional athletes, business people, uh, even Harvard professors. And, that, and those stories and those kind of real life insights um, really, in my opinion, bring the book to life because now you can talk about real life examples out there things that people have told me in interviews, I've worked for them or, you know, genuine insights. And you've got, you've got to weave all that together then into something that's easily readable, which can be challenging depending on what you're talking about, engaging. And, and ultimately, I think educational, you know, I, I like to think that people will feel better after reading the book. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll hopefully know a little more, maybe they'll have a chance to reflect and, and hopefully develop a structure that works for them in terms of assessing things um, as, they, as they go forward. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you um, a question really about sports, because I, I, I love sports. I think sports are really important um, to children's development and just learning life skills. And my kids, I have three kids and, and they play sports. And um, we we're having a conversation with my daughter this weekend a little bit about you know sports in general, and some of the things that you get from that, like uh, the learning effort and how, you know, putting forth effort and work at, you know, effort, effort you know, translates directly to success a lot of times in sports more so than, you know, maybe in other areas that you see, but that skill will kind of transcend throughout your career, depending on what you do and, and learning those things in a controlled environment, you know, in sports and, you know, help, helps you outside of that. Um, what have you learned throughout your time in sports and how that affects, you know, business and, and just being successful in general? Yeah, great question. I, th I think sports are a great parallel that you can you can look at, and, and they're very translatable to other areas of life. I mean, even if we look at our definition of success, which is something I had to think about in depth for the book. Um, I mean, it, we think about sports, and this is true for life. Um, our definition of success is subjective; it's personal to us. And while people have certain skills and talent uh, that enter var various sports. Um, that's like their ticket to the party. But ultimately, people that are, are successful in the long term are people that work hard and and uh, work on themselves, work on their game, work on their weaknesses. And, and that's very transferable to any area of life. The second thing you learn about sport is it's not, you know, success is not permanent. It's fleeting. You know, you win a trophy and the competition usually starts the next day, for, you know, for the next year, next season. Um, and, and, and that's another important lesson because... Um, Winning one thing is is not not generally success, um, and there's a, a lot of conversations around different types of of happiness, for example, and uh, the two the two prevailing I suppose types of happiness are it would be hedonic, which are our hits, you know, like wins, with trophies, you know, party and whatever it is that gets you going, you know, those endorphin hits. Um, but Aristotle, uh, you know, has this theory of eudaimonia, which is um, underlying well being. And uh, the pursuit of improvement, and I think that's really where we get to it when we talk about sports or, or anything for that matter. Um, there, there is a, there's a type of certainly fulfillment and, and a, a, you know a type of happiness to be found in uh, development or reaching towards your improvement and growth as a person or as an athlete. And uh, and it, we talk outside the sports world that that can be growth in in many ways, personal growth. Uh, spiritual growth, um, you know, growth in our relationships, and 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 that's something. There's Arthur C. Brooks is a he's a well known author. He's written a number of books, including Strength to Strength. He talks about not happiness, but happy earnest, uh, which is you know that that kind of in between state where we we might have good and bad days, but we're actually ultimately we're reaching towards something that will will make us better better people. And I think there's fulfillment and happiness to be found there, and all those things are very re relatable to sports in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think they're, I think they're very relatable. Um, going back to what you said earlier about the, the three items, you talked about control, purpose, and transcendence. Um, yes. By, by control, do you mean like autonomy and having the ability to, to kind of direct where you're going? Or, or what do you mean by control? Okay, yeah, also great question. So there's a lot of research that, that talks about um, or, you know the always-on culture and how 
Uh, you know, talk about screen time, talk about people having to fill every minute of the day with some stimulus or other. Um, particularly kids, unfortunately, and that's something we need to work with, uh, work at uh, as parents. Um, in terms of control, what I mean is our, our perceived autonomy. So uh, in, in China, for example, they have what's called the 996 culture, which I talk about in the book, which is, you know, um, a, a nine hours a day, six days a week. And um, particularly in these, you know, in, in big industry in China, uh, everything is measured and controlled. You got to make it to one aisle to scan something and make it to the next aisle to scan something else. Everything's monitored, controlled, and measured. And um, what, and this is an, at the extreme end of things, but what that sometimes results in is a thing called, the Chinese call it Bafu Singaye, which is revenge bedtime procrastination, which means that when these people get off work, then they, they now have their, their own personal time, which is very limited, a couple of hours. And it generally means that they, 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 they take what they can and that's the person who watch Netflix, play computer games, do whatever they want to do. But they end up staying up to the early hours in the morning then because they, they it's kind of a, a rebellion, so to speak, for them, personal rebellion. And they end up not getting enough sleep, going back to the same job the next day and and ultimately be borne out, you know. Now that's, that's at the extreme end of things. But we all find ourselves a little bit at the beck and call of somebody else's diary these days. Um, some, something is pulling and dragging us um, somebody else's agenda um, whether whether it can be anything from streaming services to relationships in our lives and when I talk about it in terms of control is is our ability to carve out more space for ourselves the ability to develop the, you know the power to say no to things develop our reorg- simple things if we organised in our, 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 our diaries and, and you know pushing stuff back and creating more space and time for ourselves more autonomy for ourselves and in our personal lives and that might sound like a really mundane obvious thing but i, I think that's quite powerful and practical and i, I think it's it, it's it's actually very important to be aware of for our well-being yeah yeah absolutely i think that is i, I think it's definitely one of the things that um i've noticed just as a leader and a manager you know managing people when you give people more control and more autonomy in hold them accountable to that as well. I think that's a big part of it is, is the accountability factor that you will see there. They'll, they'll rise to the occasion. It seems like. Well, that's right. I mean, and again, you're touching on something as well there, which is the motivation. And, uh, yes. you know, there was great experiments done back in the 1940s by a guy called uh, Harry F. Harlow and um, the, the Harlow monkey experiments as they were known colloquially. And, um, it was a surprising outcome. They they had all these kind of puzzles for monkeys to solve, you know, and they were trying to measure incentives. And they, the group of monkeys that had no incentives whatsoever, no peanuts or whatever, when they solved their puzzles, did 100% of the puzzles. And other monkeys that were given incentives, they didn't complete all the puzzles. And, and ultimately, the conclusion of the study, and other people had studied the research afterwards, was that there's, a, there's an inherent and intrinsic motivation in all of us, a curiosity. And to seek out challenge and to um, overcome that challenge, and there's that's pleasurable in itself, and that's a very, very powerful form of uh, motivation. And sometimes we get it wrong as employers and as parents and as as coaches, where we try and we try and create extrinsic motivations, and uh, which end up, um, you know, we we can get wrong and end up demotivating people. Quite often, people just need the space to be motivated. And as you say, the autonomy and the time uh, to to do it and, and to achieve whatever it is they want to achieve, you know. So was, that's quite an interesting area. But certainly I, I talk in depth about that. In the, uh, with, I mean, you've come across probably Marty Fish, used to be US tennis number one. And uh, Marty Fish, a uh, great documentary on, on Netflix about Marty, um, The Breaking Point. And he talks about his improvement as a tennis player. And ultimately, unfortunately, he burnt out. But he, he made a miraculous improvement, you know. But th- that wasn't due to financial awards or trophies. That was due to the fact that he was late in his career. Uh, you know, the media didn't, expected him to be retired. Everybody expected him that he'd done all he was going to do in the, te- in the tennis world. And, you know, he, he kind of said, screw you. I, I'm not content with what I've done. And I'm not going to be able to sleep at night. If, if I don't give it everything I can I can give it for the next few years to see what I can really do and that's deep intrinsic motivation and, and I, ca- I call it in the book atomic motivation because it's everlasting it comes from within it comes from a deep place and I think that's a very, that's a very important um, it's very important to be aware of particularly if we're mentoring and coaching people yeah I think that's that's really cool um, and, mm. and motivation is one of those like <sighs> It's one of those areas that is difficult to um, 
um, it, it's different for every person. So you have to figure out what that person's motivation is. Uh, but there are some truths that you mentioned in there, you know, all, all about such as like the autonomy and also purpose. So, which is your second you know, point that you, you brought up was, was purpose. And I think yes. this is really important. And, you know, one of the things that I always used to get hung up on was the big P purpose. Like, are you saving the planet or something like that? But I think small purposes mm. are, are really important as well. Just like that your job matters to somebody. And, and, you know, and I think that's a really important thing that a lot of leaders kind of forget about, you know, because we're not all, you know, saving the planet or, um, you know, helping the, the needy or whatever. Sometimes our job is just to to put widgets together on a factory floor, you know. Uh, but but we have a point and we need to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's something that I give a lot of talk to. And uh, I have a short podcast series that accompanies the book, also called The Success Complex. It's on Spotify for your listeners. And the last episode is called Purpose. And I interviewed a musician called Marcus McGee. And Marcus, wonderful guy, great musician. Um, I, was diagnosed with stage four cancer in his late thirties, early forties, young kids, uh, d- difficult situation. Um, and you know, I, I had to be gentle, but we, we, it was a conversation that blew me away because he talked about, you know, coming to the realization quite quickly that he you have a few years left and how that clarified his purpose in terms of what he wanted to get out of life. And, uh, the conversation and something I read about in the book is, is, is about what serves me meaning and purpose. So. Uh, and sometimes I'd give, give these talks with businesses and, you know, corporate training days and I ask, well, what's the difference between meaning and purpose? And for me, meaning is the gravity. So we all have, a, you know, something will resonate, uh, the gravitational pull for certain things, certain objectives, a list of objectives we could achieve will be greater than others. So uh, it's about, we already know what that is. It's just taking time to reflect on it and acting on it and uh, certainly his diagnosis cleared away that clutter and he went on and, and, and produced a great album he, he went back and played sports when he was you know in remission he went on this kind of new super test drug with some pharmaceutical company in the States and it's it's cleared up his cancer for the moment so fingers crossed yeah please God from Marcus now hopefully mm-hmm. you know things work out there and uh, but I just, I just thought we all shouldn't need a cancer diagnosis to, to prioritize develop understand what means most to us and act on it. And I talk, talk a lot in the book about that. And, and as you say, it can be, it's again, it's subjective. It's what means, it means most to you. But the, I think the killer is not to, not to get bogged down in the clutter of, of daily life, which stops us achieving whatever it is we, we want to achieve, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you're right. Not, not getting bogged down and understanding like that, you know, for a time, I got caught up in work, you know, and I think we all do early on in our careers where we're putting in probably more hours than we should. And, um, uh, I remember it came to a, a, you know, a point where we, we had just had our second child and I was like, you know, I'm not going to work this late anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of, uh, you know, the office on time. I'm going to come home. And I had a, I had a conversation with my boss. I went to my boss and sat down and just said, look, I'm not going to stay till like seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the evenings anymore. I'm going to leave work between five and six every day. And I'm going to spend time with my kids until they go to bed. After they go to bed, I'm happy to jump online and check email, do what I need to do. But I'm just letting you know, you know, going forward, I'm, I, my expectation is not to be here late in the evenings. And I remember he kind of looked at me funny and was sort of like, well, we'll see how that goes. And you know what? Everything was fine. Mm. And it was because I realized that I needed to get home. So I worked harder during the day. I had a purpose now of, of, of outside of work purpose instead of an inside of work purpose. But that outside of work purpose motivated me enough to get my job done earlier. And I, I, I bet you, you got just as much done and maybe more done. And those Absolutely. I think I got just as much done, but did it at a higher quality and a higher level because I didn't want to have to come back and do it again later. And there's lessons there. That like, it's so obvious, you know, when you're on reflection. But that probably wasn't obvious to you at the time, you know, and uh, no, ah, but it really is. And, um, you know, I, and we talk about purpose, for example, I mean, a lot of your listeners out there, I mean, there's a, a lot of people that feel lost, feel angry and feel unfulfilled out there, and particularly at the moment with whatever is going on in the world, you know, and uh, even having the word success in, in a title of a book, you know, I, I think it's provocative, you know, and sometimes it prov- provokes, provokes anger because, you know, people have been, um, you know, they, they have this missold idea of what success was going to be for them. And they may not have quite achieved it for whatever reason yet. 
Um, but I, I think it's a matter of, you know, comparisons with others are just, you know, that's not the way to go, in my opinion. I think we've got to spend time knowing what's important to us. And I know that sounds corny. It does, you know, it's an every TV, TV made for TV movie, just, you know, uh, but, but, uh, but on a practical level, it's, there's a, there's a deep truth there somewhere that, uh, that, you know, and the pandemic was a great example of that. You know, it, it gave us, it gave us time to reflect, to stop and reflect, you know, give us time to spend time with people that, that mean the most to us, uh, away from distractions that would otherwise be there, a chance to slow down. And you can see a lot of people change direction, are doing things differently now. And uh, it was also a great example, probably one of the greatest examples in history of, of humanity working together to solve a problem. So I, I think there are a lot of positives to be drawn uh, from the pandemic. And uh, I think the important thing is not to forget those those learnings and, and kind of take them with us, you know, in terms of staying with that purpose that we, or, or that meaning that we found, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of those things that is so simple, but it's so hard to do, you know, in the moment, you know, it just you get caught up in whatever thing you're doing and you forget, uh, you know, what really matters. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes taking time, slowing down and reflecting is helpful for that. I mean, just, just this past week, we spent some time as a family kind of looking back at old videos and watching our kids when they were really young and, you know, just showing them some of the things that we remember that they don't remember because they were too young Yeah, and just reflecting on that. And, you know, that little bit of time was, was, you know, I think it's super valuable of just spending that time reflecting. Absolutely. Totally. Oh my God. Yes. So important to do that. And, uh, it really is. And, you know, the other thing in, in terms of, I suppose, uh, defining success, so to speak, is, is, and is, is in the last chapter of the book, which is quite connected, I suppose, to purpose, which is transcendence. And, um, Abraham Maslow, who, you know, all your listeners will know anybody who's done a business course out there or, or, or the subject in the course, business or behavioral science. Uh, Maslow was like Freud, or, you know, he's, he's that well known, but he had this pyramid, I'm sure you know it, where it was like, yeah, the hygiene needs, your food and shelter, then your steam and back in the late 40s um, was self-actualization. Um, and it, just before he died, he, he, he reflected on that and said, well, you know what? I may have got it wrong. It wasn't self-actualization. It's the most important thing is self-transcendence. His, his view of it close to his death was that the greatest fulfillment is not found in what we do for ourselves or actualizing ourselves. It's what we do for others, self-transcendence. And uh, I, I just thought that was such a powerful, powerful kind of realization. And I, I talk in the book, about that in the, in the final chapter and how people, various people, well known people in history, came to that realization towards the end, end of their lives, you know, including Robert McNamara in that great documentary, uh, The Fog of War. You yeah, may have come across it. And, you know, how his view had changed and developed over the years. And on reflection, looking back at their life, you know, success is more about transcendence, a shared success. And uh, I'm sure you've probably seen that movie or read the book Into the Wild with Chris McChannels. Yes, I have. Where, yeah, so he, I mean, he takes this, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately fatal expedition to, to, to kind of into an isolated area of Alaska. And he tries to get away from society to find himself and experience nature. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't end with none. I don't spoil the movie and anybody, <laughs> it doesn't end well. But um, but it's a such a great movie in terms of what, what he tried to do and why. And his final entry in his journal, which was found after his death, uh, the last sentence was, unshared happiness is not happiness. And uh, I just think that's so poignant, just in the same way as unshared success is not success. And this kind of, you know, zero sum zero sum game, I win, you lose, is not success, in, in my opinion. And when we come to a definition of success, I think certainly that's not what that's not what success is anyway. For me, it's not a zero sum game. It's 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 how we can help ourselves and other others win, you know, or help others win and help ourselves win. There's that that codependence on this small planet, which is so easy to forget at times. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right when it comes to, you know, actualization versus transcendence. I mean, when you get further along, you think about your legacy more than you do yourself, you know? Yeah. You know, part of that, I'm thinking like, what am I instilling in my children? You know, what, what can they pass down? What are the important things that I want to make sure that I didn't mess up on? Yeah. <laughs> that I want to pass along. What do I, what do, what do I want to be remembered for? Um, and, and those are the kind of things that, you know, you kind of shift from what you're doing to what 
you, you will be left behind. That's right. Totally. Yeah, you do get to a stage of approaching safety and you're kind of, you know, you get to that kind of legacy point where you go, well, you know, and that was part of the reason for writing the book as well. You know, like, why not write a book and and, yeah. and, and let, let people know what you think about things? Uh, you know, so there's a little bit of that in there, although I try not to put too much personal opinion. I kind of try to let the studies and the stories do the talking. And uh, uh, it, I was very lucky in the way it fell. The book flowed quite naturally once once I kind of got into a vein of writing. Um, it's, 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 uh, you know, it, it can be, it's a difficult chore to get up and write every day for almost four years, um, you know, part-time and, uh, but it's easier when you're writing about something that, that you think is going to be meaningful to you and, and to others. Right. That so gets easier. What was the hardest part? Was it just the actual waking up and starting, you know, starting to put the pen to paper or, or was it the research, uh, the hardest part, I think, was was stepping outside of yourself and and you know and thinking is this, is this rubbish or is this valuable valuable to somebody? Oof. Where did I get this opinion from? Can I back it up? Uh, can I find some some study somewhere or some example that this is work for somebody? So I tried to stay with that as much as I could, and that took a lot of work because uh, obviously you wanted to be original. There's a, it's a very busy space, so you have to do a lot of reading around the area to see what's there. Um, listen to a lot of podcasts, audiobooks is my favorite way of kind of getting through material quickly. Uh, and then writing and writing and rewriting and editing and sending it out to people and taking feedback and having a hard neck for that feedback because it's not always what you want to hear. And then, uh, and then they'll be writing it again. And, uh, but you know, you do get to a point where you go, you kind of, right, well, I've, I've dug and dug and dug and there is a solid enough foundation there to, to, to have this opinion and be able to defend it. If somebody were to challenge, you go, listen, it's rubbish. We go, well, you know, I, I, I don't think it's rubbish because of this, this, and this, you know. Yeah. That, that's, that's where I wanted to get that. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer after all. So, you know, I, I like to, uh, you know, I, I, like to, I like to have some sort of backup to, to kind of what I'm saying because um, I'm used to being challenged on things. <laughs> that's my you got to have that so. proof, huh? Got to have that exactly. proof. Exactly. As far, as far as you can. I mean, it, you know, it's very hard to, you know, it's, it's a, there's always an element of opinion and things, but um, I try my best to, to, outline it honestly as I could um, a, you know my opinions and, and kind of the, the evidence I found for those opinions and hopefully write a structure that's uh, appealing and engaging and also entertaining we have to remember that books are books are supposed to be engaging and entertaining as well so we, you know, there's a few laughs in there and examples of things that yeah, did and didn't work out for people including myself <laughs> some parts of the stories as well so it's uh, as you know, a lot of things are about failure. Success is a lot about failure, and and, and that they're very codependent because we we can't we can't live in some sort of shell and not experience failure. We need to get out there and expose ourselves to that vulnerability in order to kind of to grow and to experience and teach others things. Yeah, and that's one of the things we're. I was talking about uh, to someone not too long ago is about you know how do you. You, you can never define how how good you can be until you get to the point where you can't get any better. Or you know, so like you're even it was a main, it was a sports thing. I was talking to somebody about sports. It's like you never know. You know, you're fearful of failure. You know, that's why you don't you're not going for the ball. That's why you're not like you know diving mm-hmm. for it because you're afraid you're going to fall. You're, you're going to fail. But you never know if you can get there or not unless you try. You know, or, or like in a baseball example. You know, you never know if you can hit the pitcher until you take take a swing. You know, you can't just stand there and get try to get walked. You got to know if you can hit it or not. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's nothing more not worse than getting that that third third strike, <laughs> waiting for a walk. I know all about it, but yeah, no, it's better to go out swinging. I think. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I always tell about those if it's those, <laughs> if it's close, <laughs> it's in the dirt. Don't be swinging. That's right. Irish sisters won't know what I'm talking about. I I, I know well enough. My God. Um. So yeah, and the, the and you know. A related point is I try to work hard to dispel some myths as well, or you know, that stop people, um, stop people trying to do things. And uh, one of the, one of the things that come up comes up quite commonly. Questions I get asked: What are the obstacles to to success or people's personal success? And I think there's a couple of obstacles. One, of course, is self doubt. Um, two is perfectionism. You know, people go, "Well, you know, I, I could never do it as well as somebody else," which which unfortunately are two things that are um, first of all. You know, per- perfectionism is overrated. Getting things done and done well is usually usually good enough. It's you know gets us on our way to somewhere that's worthwhile. Uh, Self doubt. There are ways around that in the sense that not ways around it, way through it, I should say. Which is, 
you know, the, the law of small wins, you know, like if, yeah. if you can't do that, start somewhere. The most important thing is to take those first steps, regardless of how small they are, and, and try and get some small wins on your belt and, and build from there. And also chart your progress. Even the most successful people forget to do that. They, for, they forget where they came from on this path. And it's very important what we do next, that we can see where we came from. Um, and we forget quite quickly, we really do. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I deal in the book in chapter two about defining potential, it's called, which is, again is kind of a provocative title because potential can't be defined, really. And um, I talk about the myth of IQ, EQ, and how science over, over, the, over the years and over the decades has tried to define people. Uh, by asking them questions like, and giving them a score, you know, you're you're now worth this this value, which is you know you can't you can't define creativity. IQ tests can't measure creativity. They can't measure man can't measure grit and perseverance. Um, these are things that are that are unique to each of us, and um, uh, you know, and sometimes you just got to piss people off enough to get the best out of them. Uh, you know, it's I tell people they can't do something. There's a I'm doing a master's degree at the moment in performance psychology, and you know, there's it, there's challenge and threat appraisal. You know, if we have a challenge or have something to them we need to do, which is difficult, we can see it in two ways. One is a challenge to overcome, as in, okay, I, I got to do this, I got to get better, I got to tool up, and I got to give it my best shot. Secondly, the second way looking is a threat, as in, oh my god, I'm never going to do this. I'm going to be exposed. I, I, people are going to know how bad I am at it. You know, and so there's two types of people. Um, and uh, or two ways of looking at things I should say I shouldn't say to those people and in behavioral it's, uh, in behavioral performance psychologists um, you have to try and work out how to spore people into action and build their confidence you know and there's a small subset of people which I find quite interesting in the research which which respond best to saying you know what you're probably right you're probably going to be crap at this you probably shouldn't even bother trying <laughs> and that's exactly what they need to hear to get the best out of them. That's my, that's a small subset, and but I, I'm general. I, I tend to kind of fall into that subset myself. Well, um, I mean that's that's what happened to Michael Jordan, right? He got cut. Yeah, told him he would never be you know good enough, and then what do you know? He becomes the best ever. <laughs> that's right. And I, yeah, and I was surprised to hear that the majority of people don't respond that way to things. As a surely somebody tells you can't do something, that's the motivation to do it. I know people, um, but it seems that you know we're all a little bit fragile. Of course we are, you know, and it's, it's, uh, we need encouragement. We need self-belief. We need small wins, but we also need to be told the right things at the right time by the right coach sometimes. And sometimes the the best form of coaching comes from ourselves. That's self-talk. Um, you know, and when we get in tight corners and it's, it's about tooling up uh, how we talk to ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I, I, sometimes it can be very simple. You know, it can be a word or a phrase. There was a Martin one I was talking to recently. I know I, I was trying to get these insights from athletes because it can be very revealing. I said, you know, when you, you get exhausted and you're running these national races, you know, at really high speeds, these Martins, you know, you're exa- what, do you, what do you say to yourself? You know, and he said, oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. He says, I, I, when I, one of my coaches many, many years ago when he was in school told him, um, you're really, really tired. You're in the depths of despair and you're thinking your legs are really sore or whatever it might be. Um, when you go up a hill, think think of a train, you know. I think I can and I will. I can and I will. I can and I will. When I'm go- when you're going down the other side, you know, think think of that train again, the sound that it makes. Um, uh, I, I caught and I did. I caught and I did. I caught and I did. I just thought that sounds very childish, but if you do, if you run on it to the point of exhaustion, your brain is it it breaks down into these kind of simple simple messages to yourself. And there's a lot of behavioral science and pharmacology that talks about. Holistic process goals. It could be sort of just one word that you need to get you where you need to be. In golf, it might be flow. Think flow, flow when you're swinging the golf club, or if you're if you're tired and you're doing something, think think strong, strong. So it's it's a, it, it, our, our brains working working <laughs> sometimes counterintuitive ways, and it's simpler than you think sometimes to get the best of yourself. But there's nothing like educating ourselves and tooling up as much as you can. Uh, in terms of resources um, for things that could go wrong and have a plan, you know, have some sort of plan. And I, th- I think that's really, really important, you know, for people out there. And uh, one other thing, you know, people often ask advice, what, you know, what would you say? And I've been asked to do this this kind of keynote speaker at this college graduation now in a couple of weeks' time, and I've been thinking about what I would say, you know. And there were, there were five things that kind of sprung to mind. I was kind of writing down some notes the other night. One was, you know, in the world we live in, there's no such thing as one career anymore. There's, you know, it's, it, there's diversity. And, you know, you're in the IT industry. Um, 
you know, we, it's important to tool up and get diversified in a couple of different skill sets, which are transferable to different opportunities as they arise. And I think the second thing is flexibility. We need to be, flexibility is an asset. We need to be, the world is always changing, new technology, AI, whatever. Um, we've got to be always willing to change with that world and be as flexible as we can to, to make the most of it, you know. The third thing I'd say is prioritize your health because, you know, in terms of success, there's no greater success than having the health to see your success or the success of others, really. And I, I think we've got to take health seriously. And with the stars with ourselves, it's like the only thing about the oxygen mask, you know. Put your own oxygen mask on first. You're no good to anybody else if you're not healthy, yes, both absolutely. physically and mentally. And thankfully, yeah, thankfully mental health has become to the fore now. And I think it's, uh, we're all talking to each other a little bit more, and maybe more openly. And, you know, we've got the headspace app, whatever it might be. But I think that's so important because, again, that's tooling up its resources. It it's, it's gives us support. And I, the fourth thing I'd say is reflect, you know. Reflect occasionally on, on that meaning question. We talked about Marcus Big earlier, the musician and, and the purpose, you know. Are, are the things that I'm doing now still the most meaningful things to me in terms of what I want to be doing with my time? Because we only have a limited time on this earth as it is. And, you know, why bother doing stuff like that if you don't have to? That's not the most meaningful thing to you uh, to do. So there may be reasons, but, uh, you know, and question those reasons and, and, and reflect on them. And the final thing I'd say is in terms of success, it's not about tallying achievements. It's, I, I think it's more appropriate to assess our positive impact in others as we go. And, you know, I think that's, that's worthwhile um, keeping, keeping to the front and center for us in terms of our, of our journey in, lives, in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adrian, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all the insight. And I have one last question that I, that I do want to ask you. Uh, the cover of your book, it's an athlete running. Where, where about, where did that cover come from and how does that relate? Um, yeah, well, I, I had various conversations with the publisher in terms of what, what I wanted to achieve. Um, there is a conversation in the book. Um, I don't know if you've ever read The Da Vinci Code, you know, where he talks about yeah. the, 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 the blocks of life pi and how um that pi formula is found in nature over and over again that kind of um that ratio you know animals and you know, if you look at hurricanes the shape of the hurricane can be a particular ratio and this this ratio it's one ratio keeps popping up again and again and it's also found in the pyramids um you know at giza or whatever else uh, and, and and star constellations and i thought it was a nice metaphor because um our success is unique to all of us um, and it's about finding our own ratio, our own direction. That's important. And um, I, I used to love tech drawn at school, tech, technological drawn. And one of the things we used to do was, you know, at the beginning was bisect the line to find a point. So if we take activity over here, as in, you know, you got to work hard at something and balance over here, you know, find the balance to make that sustainable and draw a line straight through both points. That's going to find a direction, a point of congruence, which gives you a kind of a, a triangle or a pyramid. And, it, and that direction is different for all of us. And what the book does, it, it kind of helps you find where that point of congruence is for you. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the purpose of the, of the drawing. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. How can people connect with you online, learn more about um, your, your book and pick up a copy if they want? Yeah, um, well, it's it's an all good uh, book outlets online. The Success Complex, Amazon is probably the main one. Um, my website is askmore.ie, and uh, I provide corporate training. I can do stuff online with with groups, mostly in talks and that kind of thing, on wellness and other things. Um, and also, I'm on LinkedIn as my kind of primary primary kind of social media uh, or social should I say yes it's a social media yeah app it would be would be LinkedIn so feel free to connect um, and uh, yeah and, and give me feedback and also yeah we have that uh, podcast series that three episode podcast series on the book as well which is great got to speak to some of the, the people that are written the book that are profiled there uh, three episodes and that's on Spotify and it's also called The Success Complex and John it's been great to speak to you as well and uh, well done on everything you're doing with, with your podcast series all right. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll look that too in the show notes at concluder.com so people can go there and click through. Um, again, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to concluder.com to learn more about what this guest is up to, click on their links, and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could 
leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you have subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.